Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Plodcast. This audio is brought to you by Canon Press. Before we get started, I wanted to recommend a book to you called The Household and the War for the Cosmos by C.R. Wiley, Recovering a Christian Vision for the Family. It has a foreword by Nancy Piercy and a preface by Anthony Esselin. The household is not just a shelter from a war zone, it is the command center from which we launch our attacks. It's this vision of the world, with the Christian family at the heart, that modern parents desperately need to recover. You can find The Household and the War for the Cosmos by C.R. Wiley at canonpress.com and listen to the audio on the Canon app. Welcome to the podcast. This is episode 181. I'm pretty sure it's 181. Yes, it's 181. That is true. Welcome to the podcast 181. So I, I want to speak for a few minutes about the situation we're in. I've uh, told our people at Christchurch a number of times that these are times of tumultuous mercies. I believe that God is a God who delivers his people. Uh, if you read through Psalm 125, you see that God's people are surrounded by the mountains, and God, God would be the mountains that surround his people. Yeah, that's Psalm 125. In, um, earlier in the Psalms, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Uh, God loves to deliver his people just in time. He loves to bring them right to the brink. Abraham has the knife raised in the air uh, about to slay his son Isaac, and that's when God stops him. And then it became proverbial in Israel, on the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. At just the right time, it will be provided. You might be tempted to feel that he's going to intervene just after the nick of time, but he intervenes just at the nick of time. David is on one side of the mountain, fleeing from Saul. Saul is on the other side of the mountain in hot pursuit. And right then, the the Philistines invade and Saul has to go off and deal with them. Or you have people of Israel standing on the banks of the Red Sea, a million, a north, there's north of a million of them standing on the banks of the Red Sea, and they, they look behind them, and there are, there's the dust from all Pharaoh's chariots coming for them to enslave them again. And, and Moses tells them, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. It would be really hard for them to envision that in just a short space of time, all of those chariots behind them were going to be under the water that was in front of them. But that's what happened. Uh, God, del- God delivers them, and God delivers them because that's how he loves to do it. He, uh, Paul says in Corinthians in one place that we uh, got to the point where we despaired of life, and he says that happened because God wanted us to know that we served a God who raises the dead. God is a God who is the God of resurrection. He's the God who, our, our God loves brinksmanship. Our God loves brinksmanship. And this means that the um, chaos around us is tumultuous, uh, but it's not the kind of tumultuous, it's not the sort of thing that can touch God's people in any significant way. And even when God's people are martyred, or even when things happen, it's not as though it ha- happened that on an earthly level are considered to be terrible or awful, you know, when you have um, people who are actually, people who are actually martyred. God gives them a glimpse of where they're going. So, for example, when Stephen is martyred, uh, you don't have a, it, that's not an example of brinksmanship where uh, they were furious with Stephen and they grabbed him to stone him and they they all had their stones in their hands and then Something happens and Stephen gets away. Stephen is actually killed. Stephen is, um, is martyred, but he also is martyred with a glimpse of the Lord Jesus standing at the right hand of God the Father. So even that, even when things go well for the wicked from their vantage point, it's not really going well. God is still with his people. God still encompasses and surrounds his people. And one of the things that we should be praying for, looking for, expecting, trusting God for, is that God will provide us 
with a land of Goshen in which to dwell as the plagues are raining down on Egypt. So, you want to uh, know who your people are. You want to love your people, love your God and love your people, stay close to your people, and be trusting God to protect you. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Again, Psalm 125, you're, you dwell in the mountains, and God is the mountain range that you're dwelling in. Your city, your citadel, your fortress is, in, is located in the God mountains. These are tumultuous times, but we ought not to, we ought not to be uh, frantic or uh, wrapped up with concern about it. Uh, you remember a number of years ago, there was a, there was a hearing in Congress about what, how many troops we had on Guam, stationed on Guam, and one congressman was asking whether we had to worry about Guam tipping over. Well, there's a difference between, I, I believe that if we are worshiping God rightly, we are like an, the nations of men when they roar. The nations of men through, in Scripture are frequently compared to a turbulent ocean or an ocean in a storm. Uh, and our position as believers is like Hawaii in uh, the middle of the Pacific in a typhoon, uh, as opposed to false religionists or as opposed to even true Christians who have a, uh, an anemic kind of worship. I, I compare it to a huge balsa raft, a, a huge raft made out of balsa wood. If you're out on the ocean on a raft made out of balsa wood and a typhoon rises, you're going to have a time. You're going to have a tough time of it. Now, if a hurricane strikes Hawaii, yeah, it can knock some houses down and can blow some trees over and likely will. And you can have, if you live there, uh, you can have a time. But it's not going to sink the island because the island is the top of a mountain. The, the island is the top of a mountain that goes down to the depths of the sea. It's not going to budge. Uh, so our, our position as believers is like a mountaintop, a mountaintop in the midst of an ocean. The ocean can rise. The, the storms can rage. But the people of God are always secure. These are, uh, this is a tumult but it is tumultuous mercy. So continuing on with uh, podcast episode 181, uh, we're back in our hamartiology class. You can take this class, just don't become hamartiology majors. The next word in our lexicon of sin is damaniodes, damaniodes, and it is rendered by our translators as devilish. And the word occurs in James 3.15. This is the one place the word occurs. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Now, notice that this sin is called wisdom. It's a particular kind of wisdom. This wisdom descendeth not from above. It's not heavenly wisdom, but it's, a, it's called wisdom, and it is earthly, sensual, and devilish wisdom. The nature of this sin is seen in the preceding and the following verses. So I'm going to read 15 again, but with uh, starting at 14 and going through 16. And you can see the nature of this wisdom that is earthly, sensual, and devilish. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom, what the wisdom of envy and striving, this wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where envying and strife is, it's returning to the two culprits, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. So, envy and strife are essentially diabolical. We see here, and, and you can see at a glance, that diabolical sins, devilish sins, are the kind that can show up in a nasty church fight. The, we sometimes think that sins are limited to brothels and taverns. Uh, no, there's, there are the worst sins, pride, arrogance, envy, striving, backbiting. Uh, the, worst, the very worst sins can show up at elder meetings. The very worst sins can show up at general assembly and presbytery. Envy and striving, you know, well, can envy and striving show up at presbytery? Yes, you may not. In fact, some of you may not remember a time when they didn't show up at Presbytery. They can break out in a congregational meeting. 
you you can be given over to diabolical passions while you're singing a hymn. And this is why uh, I think the Lord says that prostitutes and tax collectors are closer to the kingdom because prostitutes and tax collectors know that they have a problem. They know that they're sinners. Uh, the people who, who give way to envy and striving who are diabolical or who are devilish don't know. All right? They are righteous in their own eyes. And that's something we, uh, I think, forget too easily. We need to remember that the devil is self-righteous. The devil is self-righteous. He accuses the brethren day and night before the throne, as it says. So accusation, pointing away from your own sin, focused on someone else's sin, focused on someone else's problems, that is truly diabolical. So continuing on with uh, podcast episode 181, we come now to our book review. And uh, the book review this time is um, Ideas Have Consequences by Richard Weaver. Now, it w- may well be, I didn't go back and check the records, and, and my records are not all that easy to check, actually. But since this is podcast episode 181, it's quite possible that I've reviewed Ideas Have Consequences before, but that's all right. I'm, I'm doing it again because I'm uh, going through it again. I've uh, read Ideas Have Consequences. I think this is the third time I've um, read through it. I read it once a long time ago, back in the day. And it was very, very good, influential in my life. And then I reread it at some point, um, taking notes in the margins, and I'm listening to it now, listening to an audible uh, version of Ideas Have Consequences. Richard Weaver is basically an old-school conservative, and uh, the, the sensibilities of old-school conservatism are sensibilities that we need to recover. And we need to recover them even if we are, find ourselves disagreeing at places. So, for example, I just uh, finished going through his critique of jazz. All right, so jazz was a thing when he was a jazz and swing. And he's quite critical of, of jazz as being the uh, harbinger of nothing good, right? And, but it, it would be, it's so easy for us to roll our eyes at things like that and say, Oh, a, ty- a typical conservative curmudgeon who doesn't like anything that his grandfather didn't do, as, as though that sort of critique is nothing but hidebound prejudice. So uh, Richard Weaver died before the, before the music revolution spread into rock and everything that followed from that. I can only imagine what he would say about that. And, and he's tra- he traces in this book, he traces our problems all b- all back to William of Ockham and his un- introduction of uh, nominalism, where there was an abandonment of transcendental reality, and that's the heart of his. That's the heart of Weaver's book, and that's the thing that we need to recover. Human societies cannot function without a transcendental anchor. If all we have is what we have down here, then you've got nothing nothing but conflict and friction and competition and selfishness and the kind of pandemonium that our culture is disintegrating, uh, deteriorating uh, into. So when, when Weaver critiques something like jazz and he says this is a musical expression of the deterioration that we're seeing in the world of philosophy and the world, in the world of culture, and then we look at what our culture has done since Weaver's time, you would have a hard if he if he were alive today and he and he had not abandoned the point. You would be hard pressed to point to uh, those aspects of our culture that were positively affected by the things that he says were a negative effect. I do differ with him on jazz, and I would differ with him, no doubt, on rock. But I think that it's important for Christians to hear and sympathize uh, to understand his argument and to be sympathetic with it. You don't have to agree with it to be in sympathy with it, because I think that there is more than a little uh, edification for us in that. But the basic point, the center of his book, is the need for a transcendental reality. We need to be bound together with 
something that Congress can't get at. We need to be bound together by something larger than any of our earthly rulers. And, of course, for Christians, this uh, reality would be the Word of God. This reality would be Christ. And this is why Christians who serve the transcendent God are considered to be such enemies by men who want everything to be, uh, you know, they want their, um, their power, their authority to be the ultimate. Francis Schaeffer said in, um, in How Shall We Then Live? Francis Schaeffer said, if there is no absolute, what Weaver would call a transcendental, a transcendental reality, if there is no absolute by which to govern society, then society is absolute. But because society is down here, uh, Schaefer would hasten to add, society is arbitrary and absolute. The, the absolute can change. The ab- <laughs> so ba- basically, uh, we can serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, we can serve the one in whom there is no variation or shadow due to change, all right? and that, uh, an absolute that acts like an absolute. Or we can drag it all down here, abandon a truly transcendental, transcendent, and make society absolute. But what we now have is a fickle absolute. But fickle absolutes are oxymoronic. Fickle absolutes are no good. Fickle absolutes are no good at all. Basically, if you are wanting um, intellectual refurbishment, rearmament in the times that we're living in, uh, ideas have consequences. Is um, It's a good one. Mm-hmm.